Okay, lesson four of our A-level history course, Stresemann and Stability. Uh, the questions which you'll need to be able to answer, discuss, debate are how did Stresemann contribute to Germany's recovery, both in the role of Chancellor and as Germany's Foreign Minister? Why did Gustav Stresemann, however, polarise public opinion in Germany? So there were some that supported him, others that vehemently opposed him. And just how stable was the Weimar Republic just before the Great Depression? Um, I'm not going to talk about these, but just do make sure. History is about, you know, debate, discussion, interpretation, and so on. But you, you do need to commit some things to memory. So do make sure, please, that you've committed this timeline of significant events during the period to memory. Let's move on with the lesson and look at Gustav Stresemann himself. So in 1907... Uh, as a young man, he entered the Reichstag as a member of parliament, as a politician. He began, actually, as something of a moderate conservative. He was, was right-wing, but moderate right-wing, not extreme right-wing. However, during the First World War, his politics did shift towards the right. He became much more stridently nationalistic. Um, and his party, the German People's Party, the DVP is the German People's Party, was monarchist, and it was anti-republic. Uh, in 1919, for example, it voted against the constitution uh, alongside the extreme left-wingers. In 1920, um, he kind of he waited on the sidelines. He didn't condemn the cat putsch, as you know, as an, as an anti-democratic thing. So he was, you know, politically quite right-wing, right, quite quite nationalist. However, he was a pragmatist. Now, a pragmatist is somebody that realises that they want to achieve certain things, but maybe they can't achieve everything they want. So they may have to compromise and get the next best thing. Uh, and Stresemann was certainly a pragmatist. He was shrewd, which kind of means he was sort of, he was cunning, he was clever. Um, he wasn't obvious, or, or certainly not stupid. Uh, he was imaginative in, in his solutions. And he was definitely courageous, and we'll, we'll see some examples of those qualities later on. And as a pragmatist, even though he uh, was against many of the, the, you know, the territorial losses in Versailles, he was a nationalist, he decided to work with the Republic. In some ways, a bit like the uh, elder German statesman Bismarck, who defined politics as the art of the possible. So let's look at him as Chancellor. I've chosen that picture of a, of a ship sailing, sorry, sailing through stormy waters because that's kind of what Stresemann did as Chancellor. So he was only Chancellor for a brief time, uh, only for three months, but did a significant things during that time. So he called off passive resistance in the Ruhr, which is definitely an example of him being courageous because it opened him up to a lot of criticism from right-wing nationalists. He oversaw the introduction of the Rentenmark, which eventually became the Reichsmark, which helped to end the hyperinflationary crisis. He put down the revolt of the communists in Saxony. He sent the, the Free Corps in to brutally deal with a communist revolt in the state of Saxony. And he played a waiting game with the right-wingers um, in Bavaria in, in, during the time of the so-called Beer Call Putsch and basically let them implode. So that's an example of it being quite shrewd, quite clever, playing a waiting game with those. However, the, the mismatch between the brutal way he dealt with the extreme left-wingers and the more mild way he dealt with the right-wingers down in Bavaria um, led to the Social Democrats uh, leaving the government. They were angered at the way he treated the left wing more harshly than the right wing, and Stresemann resigned as Chancellor. His career as a politician was far from over, though, and in subsequent coalition governments, he was often foreign minister and instrumental in quite a lot of foreign policy decisions. Well, looming over German foreign policy and looming over Germany was the diktat as Germany saw it, Many in Germany, most in Germany, saw the Treaty of Versailles. Now, the right-wing nationalist party, the DNVP, they saw that the diktat should be dealt with simply by refusal, refuse to obey the diktat of the Versailles Treaty. That was what they called for. 
Now, Walter Rathenau, if you recall, was assassinated by the organization consul under Hermann Erhardt. He advocated a policy of fulfillment, of obeying the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, hoping eventually perhaps to get some of the more extreme uh, parts of the treaty overturned. See, even the uh, Social Democrats thought that the treaty was unfair. Uh, this was an outrage to the to, to right-wing nationalists and, and the DNVP. However, Stresemann decided to adopt the policy of fulfillment. He saw diplomacy as Germany's only option. Yes, he was a nationalist. Yes, he wanted to reclaim territory for Germany. But he saw diplomacy as the way to go. Again, an example of him being a pragmatist. Uh, he was accused by many on the right of being a, a, a woolly-headed idealist. But, you know, he wasn't. He was a nationalist, as we've said. He, but he was, however, a realist, and he did want to reclaim land for Germany, but saw the policy of fulfilment as the way to go. So let's have a look now at some of his foreign policy achievements. In 1924, the Dawes Plan, that's a picture of the American banker Charles Dawes there, they agreed to resume payment of reparations. Uh, this meant also there was a reduction in the amount of instalments, which was beneficial for the German economy. Um, there was an issue of some loss of sovereignty, as the Allies did take control over the German National Bank to some degree. Uh, but it did result in the end of the French and Belgian occupation of the Ruhr, and also loans of $200 million, mainly from American investors, which helped to rejuvenate the German economy. Um, one of the uh, next things that happened, 1926, the Locarno Pact. Uh, this was a foreign policy agreement between France and Germany, where they, uh, there was an agreement over the western borders of Germany. You know, they, they wouldn't go to war over them anymore. Significantly, there was no agreement on the eastern borders of Germany. Uh, Stresemann, in particular, was hoping to reclaim land in uh, the Polish corridor. No agreement there. But what um, it did say, so just to point out, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria, not mentioned at all in the Locarno Pact. Um, but some beneficial uh, results for Germany from this. Uh, the French agreed not to engage in any future occupations of German soil like they had done in the Ruhr. And also, Germany had to re renounce its ambition to take the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, but not really that bad because this wasn't really a realistic option anyway. As a result of this, Germany was admitted to the League of Nations. So it's uh, admitted to the international community. In some ways, can be viewed as a foreign policy success. Move forward now to 1929 and the Young Plan, which is agreed just before the, you know, the, the Great Depression uh, breaks out. This again is uh, uh, about reparations, a, a huge reduction actually in the amount of reparations from £6.6 .6 billion pounds to £1.85 billion. Pounds. It replaced the Dawes Plan, which was only ever intended to be uh, temporary anyway. Uh, as a result of the Young Plan, the Allies ended their occupation of the Rhineland. There had been uh, some French and I believe some British troops stationed in the Rhineland. They withdrew from German soil, uh, which really was a foreign policy success for Stresemann. He was able to claim that Germany is now free from occupying forces. However, even though this, this marked a, a reduction in rep reparation payments, it was still a reparation payments were still going on. And right-wing elements, uh, particularly Alfred Hugenberg uh, in, in the, in the right-wing press, they bitterly complained about the, the young plan. Here you've got this demonic foreign figure here whipping on these toiling Germans. You've got an old German, a, a, a working German there. And the future generations of Germany condemned in the eyes of nationalists to unfair reparations under the diktat of foreign powers. So let's move on and look at the economy now. Was the economy during this period booming? Well, to some extent, yes. The crisis of hyperinflation had ended and there was an influx of foreign investment, particularly from American investors and American banks. This allowed um, German businesses to upgrade their machinery uh, and production in, in many areas rose. Uh, the government was able to uh, spend money on house building schemes there's actually uh, I think hundreds of thousands of houses were built for, for poorer German workers. So if you're that way inclined, a success there. 
wages did manage to keep, in general, for most workers, managed to keep in pace with inflation. At the time, actually, this was a cultural factor in Germany and also throughout um, the West as well, in, in, in America too. A lot of spending. People didn't really save a lot of money at the time. They tended to spend their wages, which in one way is good for the economy because people, when, when people are spending money, businesses make more money. You know, you've got this typical image of the roaring 20s of people drinking champagne and dancing the night away in nightclubs and so on. So a lot of spending does keep the economy going. The thing is, though, spending is linked to debt, and the German economy was debt-laden as well as the individual Germans. It depended on these American loans, and a situation of dependency is a situation of instability if those loans are taken away. The agricultural sector in the world, actually, was depressed. Uh, we do, I don't mean you've got lots of glum farmers. Well, the farmers were glum. But what we, say, what we mean by agricultural depression is the price of commodities, agricultural commodities, uh, wheat and so on, had really fallen a lot, which meant, you know, problems for farmers, basically, worldwide. If your stuff is selling for a lot cheaper, you're not making a lot of money. I mean, this was linked to complicated uh, uh, economic forces, uh, th uh, technological forces, the mechanisation of farmland and so on. Uh, meant that basically the, agricult sec the ag agricultural sector, I'm sorry, was depressed. So uh, farmers within Germany didn't enjoy the uh, booming economy so much. There was as well a lot of friction between business owners, employers, and employees. The trade unions were obviously campaigning for, for wages to, 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 be, um, to, to, to be good for, for, the, for the workers. Uh, they often went on strike to try uh, and increase the, the, the wages of their workers. This was met with resentment. Remember, the workers are, are more likely to be socialists, uh, and the business owners are more likely to be sort of right-wing in their opinions. Uh, and so the businesses, whilst they're upgrading their machinery, they're also doing that in a way to sort of reduce labour costs. When you have, If you have more efficient machinery, you need less workers. So there's some friction there between employers and employees. Public spending as well was particularly high. Uh, you know, you've got your house building schemes, those are something called the Unemployment Insurance Act. So the government spending is particularly high and there is a pretty big budget deficit uh, in the German government. It's spending more money than it's getting in tax revenues and so on and it basically owes a lot of money. This is not stable and it's financing its spending by borrowing. Again, you've got this borrowing, you've got this dependency on particularly foreign investors. Let's move on and look at political stability now. How stable was the Weimar Republic during this period? Well, in some ways, yes. There was the hunger and desperation of, of the, the early years of the Republic had finished. The, the naval blockade had finished and there was less hunger and desperation throughout Germany. There were no attempts at political coups, such as happened in 1919, uh, right, right through to 1923, early on. There were no putsch attempts by the right wing and the left wing. And in fact, votes for the extreme right wing parties, the Hugenbergs, uh, German Nationalist Party, the DNVP, and the growing National Socialist Party, votes actually declined uh, throughout there. In 1928, votes for the extreme right-wing parties had actually declined. Um, however, on the other side of the coin, um, there was resentment and disillusionment in the middle class in Germany. Remember that they're the, they're the ones that suffered in the hyperinflationary crisis. They saw house building and the Unemployment Insurance Act of 1927 as the government spending money on sort of lazy, undeserving people, whereas they were paying for it in their taxation. Uh, 1925 as well, uh, Friedrich Ebert dies and is voted in is, um, is Hindenburg, President Hindenburg is the President of Germany. Now Hindenburg is actually a conservative um, authority authoritarian. He, he's not actually an, an a special fan of democracy. So the fact that really with the aid of the middle class votes, a conservative authoritarian like Hindenburg is voted in, does show perhaps that confidence, faith in democracy, isn't as strong as it might be. There persists an extremist threat as well. Although they're not getting a lot of votes, uh, the Nazis or the communists, they are, you know, they're on the fringes of German society. They remain a threat. Ernst Thalmann, for example, the leader of the German communists uh, during the 1920s, basically gets his orders directly from Moscow. 
He's basically almost like a Soviet plant within Germany. And the aim of the KPD is to overthrow democracy and establish a, a Soviet-style uh, communist state. They are battled in the streets. The, the Stumab Abtelung, the, the brown shirts of the Nazis, engage in street battles with the Red Front fighters of the KPD, of the Communist Party. So that's hardly an indicator of stability. It's not an indicator of stability when you've got street battles between paramilitary thugs. Uh, the Nazis are on the left, <laughs> although they're on the right politically, and the Red Front fighters of the Communists. So you've got street battles, hardly an indicator of stability. So, why was Gustav Stresemann controversial? Well, I've noticed I've spelt his name wrong there. It should be 1s, 2ns. Apologies now. Well, he was actually admired by the moderates. Ironically, although he was really something of a right-wing nationalist, he tended to be admired by the moderates, by the Social Democrats, by the Catholic Centre Party, and by the German Democratic Party. Well, why did they admire Stresemann? They recognised and acknowledged his political courage in doing the hard things that were necessary, despite seeming to be not popular measures, things like negotiating the end of hyperinflation, like negotiating the Locarno treaties. His foreign policy in particular, they saw as restoring Germany's position in the world, its respectability among nations, and in that, in that sense he appeared to be a great statesman. He was, however, despised by the extreme right, again, ironically, despite being rather right-wing himself. Both the German Nationalist Party, the DNVP, and the National Socialist Party said he was a turncoat, a traitor. They despised his policy of fulfilment. They saw it as agreeing to the lie of the war guilt clause. And the Young Plan, or even though it, um, the negotiations of the Young Plan re resulted in a, a decrease in reparations payments and foreign troops moving out of the Rhineland, for them it was simply an extension of the Versailles lie. In 1929, in fact, the Nationalists and the Nazis uh, tried to get a referendum of no, a no-confidence vote in Stresemann through the German Reichstag. Well, to show you even then that there, there wasn't particularly support for them, a wide base of support towards the end of the 1920s, that only got, I think, a 14% vote. So, although it's a significant vote, fair amount of support for Stresemann throughout the 1920s. Well, let's have a look then. So, it's just how instrumental how vital was Stresemann himself to the period of relative stability, controversial perhaps, the so-called golden years of the Weimar Republic? Well, the policy of fulfilment um, pursued by Stresemann um, did allow Germany back onto the world stage and ended up in more favourable negotiations of reparations. But it wasn't born by Stresemann. It was actually a policy of Walter Rathenau, if you recall, the gentleman that was assassinated by the organisation consul under um, um, Hermann Erhard. So the policy of fulfilment, yes, he pursued it, but he wasn't the author of that policy. Also, in 1923, as well as Stresemann's actions helping to preserve the Republic, there was extensive use of Article 48, the emergency powers, by the Social Democrat MP Friedrich Ebert. So he can't claim solely to be the only captain steering the German ship through the stormy waters of 1923. Again, although he was instrumental in the negotiation of the Rentenmark, the Doors and the Young Plans, particularly with the economic aspects of the Rentenmark and the Young Plan, the German economist Hjalmar Schacht also played a significant role there. So he was, you know, he was, he was aided, he depended on others. In fact, he depended on coalition governments to be, um, to be uh, responsive, to be cooperative with his plans. And often, as we say, it was the Social Democrats, the Centre Parties, the Moderate Parties that did cooperate with Stresemann's foreign policy decisions. And it also depended on the accommodation, on the understanding of Britain, France and the United States. So I hope overall, oh hang on, we haven't finished yet. Oh yeah, good point here. Stresemann himself acknowledged the financial instability of the fact that the German economy was dependent on loans. He famously said in 1929 that the German economy is Germany is dancing on a volcano. Hardly a picture of stability. Um, the other thing as well, to, to perhaps um, tarnish his reputation to an extent, especially if you are a German nationalist, is that he didn't achieve his long-term objectives of regaining Polish territory. For example, the uh, Polish territory, German territory as he saw it anyway. 
Uh, for example, the Polish corridor uh, remained outside Germany. And another ambition that Stresemann shared with particularly the DNVP, the German Nationalist Party and German Conservatives, is re-establishing German control over the colonies. And that wasn't achieved either. OK, so I hope you've made some uh, useful notes and that you can uh, talk meaningfully uh, about the three major questions. And I'll see you in the lesson.